Well, we're going to uh, continue our, our study of the book of Mark. We're going to look at the passage in chapter 6, verses 1 through 29 that Joel read. And what we're going to see in this first part of chapter 6 of Mark is foreshadowing of the way that things are going to go for Jesus. Essentially, we've got three parts in our text. We have Jesus' rejection at Nazareth. We have the mission of the twelve that he sends out on a short-term mission. And we have the story of the death of, of John the Baptist. And two of, the, uh, of, of, the, of these three stories are very ominous. Even though in chapters 2 and 3 we saw the beginning of the rejection of Jesus. We saw that the political leaders of the day began to reject him. We saw that the religious leaders of the day began to reject him. We saw that his family rejected him. In spite of the fact that we've already seen that, his rejection at Nazareth by a larger group of people who very appropriately could be called his own people, and the, the death of John the Baptist, which is a foreshadowing of his own death, both of those things are very ominous. And the last of those things, the death of John the Baptist, which foreshadowed Christ's own death, is also ominous for us as well. In fact, what we see there is something that runs contrary to any notion that following Christ is something that is easy or comfortable or especially that it's safe. Paul shared last week that God is not safe. And something that we see here in this chapter is that following Christ is not safe. And so this is a very hard story to deal with, and, and I hope that we'll get two things out of this passage. One, I hope that we will come away with a very sober and realistic understanding of what it means to follow Christ, that we will soberly embrace just what it is that God has and hasn't promised us as followers of Christ. And at the same time, I hope that we will come away being hopeful, understanding that we are not on the side of a losing cause, remembering what we saw in chapter 4 in the parables of the kingdom, that ultimately the kingdom of God will triumph, that we're on the winning side, and that we do have a glorious hope in the future and even in the present. And yet, nonetheless, we need to really seriously grapple and come to terms with uh, what it means to follow Christ, and, and we see uh, some very sobering things here in this chapter. So the first thing that we see in verses 1 through 6 in Christ's uh, visit to Nazareth is we see a foreshadowing of His rejection by the people of Israel at large. In John chapter 1, verse 11, John said that Christ came to His own and that His own did not receive Him. And in the bigger scheme of things, that's referring to the people of Israel, that they didn't receive Christ. And so in His hometown, and the fact that Christ is rejected in His hometown, as I said, among a people who very appropriately could be called His own people, we see a microcosm and a foreshadowing of his rejection uh, by the people of Israel at large. Um, at the end of chapter 5, when, Je when Jesus had resurrected the daughter of Jairus, uh, only Peter and James and John were with him. But we see at the beginning of chapter 6 that all 12 of the disciples are with him. And we also see that when Jesus is there, that he teaches at the synagogue. And so we should understand that Jesus, even though Jesus had grown up in Nazareth, even though we could say that Nazareth was his hometown, this was not just a family visit. This was a ministry visit. Jesus went there as a rabbi with his 12 disciples, and he went there to teach. And there's a few things that I think we should consider in the story. First, we should ask the question, how is it that the people of Nazareth rejected Jesus? And I think that basically they did it in three ways. Um, first of all, they did it not by denying that Jesus taught with authority and power. They couldn't deny that. That was clear to them. But instead of considering what Christ had to say, instead of hearing Him and listening, and taking into account the things that he was teaching, their only concern was with the origin of his teaching. Instead of saying, wow, let's, let's think about what he's saying here. All they could say is, where's this guy getting this? Isn't, this, isn't he one of us? Didn't he grow up here? Isn't this the son of, of Mary and his brothers? And isn't he a carpenter? Where, where is this coming from? And uh, you can think how annoying that might have been to Jesus. Jesus is proclaiming to them good news about the kingdom of God, and they don't care. All they want to know is they just, you know, something is awry here. Let's get to the bottom of this. How is, where is this guy coming up with this stuff? And so implicitly they rejected him by not hearing him, by not taking into account the things that he had to say, but by being more concerned with getting to the bottom of how did this local carpenter who grew up here among us, how did he come up with this stuff? Um, 
Also, it seems like they may have seemed to imply that Jesus was an illegitimate child. It's interesting, they, they say, isn't this the son of Mary? That's kind of a strange thing to do in Jewish culture at the time. It would have been more appropriate and more normal for them to have said, isn't this the son of Joseph or the son of Joseph and Mary? And so they may have meant to imply that he was illegitimate. And like the religious leaders that we saw earlier in chapters 2 and 3, they may have intended by that to imply that the source because they're asking all these questions, where is, he come, where is he coming up with this? It seems like they may have meant to imply that the source of his teaching and his power was not from God, but may have been demonic. Most of all, they rejected him by simply not believing in him. Uh, this is one of the two places in the Gospels where it says that Jesus marveled at something. Uh, the other time is when he marvels at the great faith of, of the Roman centurion, and here he marvels uh, at the unbelief of the people. Now, second, we should ask, um, why is it that they rejected Christ? And I think that primarily the reason that they rejected Christ is, as, is as the old adage says, familiarity breeds contempt. They had known Jesus his whole life. He had grown up uh, around them. And it seems like they were, it says they were offended by him. So it seems like they knew that he was just a carpenter. He was just a common local person that he had grown up, that they had grown up with. And according to the parallel passage in Luke, he had been teaching from uh, the book of Isaiah. And so it seems like they were saying basically, Who's, who does this guy think he is? He's not a rabbi. He wasn't, he wasn't formally trained. He's just a carpenter. What's, what's he doing coming in here uh, trying to tell us things? He just, he's no better than us. And so it seems like um, they rejected him because familiarity bred contempt. They, they thought that they really knew who Christ was and, and they were unimpressed. What were the consequences of this rejection? According to verses 5 and 6, very few people were healed. Whereas in other places that Jesus had been previously, He had healed great multitudes of people. Uh, earlier we saw in Capernaum, He healed everyone that they brought to Him. He healed a great number of people. Here He only healed a, a very few. You might have a question there. It says that He could do no mighty work there. We shouldn't understand that in His power He was limited. Rather, we should understand that the condition that He Himself had put upon healing people and upon forgiving people's sins was the condition of faith. And so he was unwilling to do that because they did not believe in him. He was unwilling to heal them without uh, the, the presence of faith. And then the other um, consequence here is simply that it's a very sad consequence. These people in rejecting Christ rejected the very message that could have saved them. Certainly, in light of what we've been seeing, Christ would have been proclaiming to them the message of the kingdom of God. He would have been calling them to repent and to believe the gospel in order that they might be saved. And so sadly, in rejecting Christ, they rejected the very message that could have saved them. I want to stop here and, and bring up a couple of applications. Uh, first of all, these Nazarenes, as I've just said, they rejected Christ because familiarity bred contempt. They thought that they had Jesus figured out. They thought that they really knew exactly who He was and consequently they were not impressed. They, couldn't, they were blinded to His majesty. And I think that for those of us that are Christians and have been Christians for a long time and who have become very familiar with the Word of God, there's a danger that this could happen to us as well. There's a danger that we could become so familiar with the Word and so familiar with the things of God that we lose a sense of awe and of majesty. And we need to be careful here because there's, there's two extremes. On the one hand, we don't need to say that God is so mysterious that we can't say anything truly about Him. He has spoken in His Word. He's told us things that are true that we can know with absolute certainty. But at the same time, we should recognize that God is infinitely great. And we shouldn't ever get to the point where we think we've got Him all figured out. Can we say things that are true about Him? Yes. Do we know everything we need to know to be saved and to live the Christian life as the Lord revealed that? Yes. But at the same time, just like the people of Nazareth didn't really fully comprehend who Christ was and His glory and His majesty, neither have we. And so we need to be vigilant and guarding our hearts and praying to the Lord that our, exposed familiar, our, our, our continued exposure to the Word of God would not produce in us a, a coolness and a dryness and a deadness, but rather that, it would, it, that we would come to appreciate the truths more, that they would be impressed deeper on our hearts, that they would become sweeter 
to us. And I think that's a, a, a challenge that we constantly need to be aware of and striving um, to avoid. A second application here um, has to do with our own sanctification. Uh, we've shared before that the goal of our sanctification is conformity to Christ. It's to be made more like Christ in our character. And what we see here is that Christ, even before His passion, even before His suffering and death on the cross, one of the things that He suffered was rejection and scorn and hate from people that knew Him. And so how could we as believers think that following Christ might not lead to the same thing in our case? In other words, we need to recognize that following Christ may very well lead to our being rejected by friends or family or people who know us well. It's not as if there are two options for the Christian life, the, the, the easy one where you're accepted and popular and then the hard one uh, where, you're, where you're treated the way Jesus was. There's only one way to follow Christ and we need to soberly recognize that following Christ many times does bring about scorn and rejection from people that we know. And imagine that uh, probably everyone here, if you've been a, a believer for very long, has experienced that. I know that, that I have, and I imagine you have as well. And on the one hand, we just need to soberly recognize that's part of the cost of following Christ. If you want to be loved by everyone and not rejected by anyone, um, that's impossible to do while following Christ. Following Christ is divisive. Uh, people reject Christ, and consequently they reject those who follow Him. But at the same time, like the apostles in Acts 5, 40, and 40, 40 through 42, we should rejoice when that happens. We should rejoice that we're counted worthy to uh, suffer dishonor for Christ's name. All right, moving on to the second part of this, we have the uh, mission of the 12 disciples. And so here we have foreshadowing also of something that's going to happen later at the very end of the gospel, the Great Commission, where Christ is going to send the apostles out uh, in order to take the kingdom of God to the whole world. It's something that carries on even until today. And so in thinking about this, um, this story, I want to think about five things. I want to think about the motivation for the mission. Why did Christ do this here? What preparation did the disciples have? What authorization did they have? What were the special instructions that He gave them? And then what was the fruit of the mission? First of all, what was the motivation? Why at this point does Christ send these disciples out to uh, do the same things that He did, to preach and teach and, and cast out demons and, and heal people? Well, in light of the second half of verse 6, uh, it seems like at the second half of verse 6, it says that uh, after His rejection in Nazareth, that Jesus went out among the villages teaching. And so it's possible that having been out among the villages, Jesus felt impressed upon Himself, a sense of urgency, a desire that His message of, of the kingdom of God would go to more places. And so He sends the disciples out in order to multiply His efforts. But more so, I think that the point of this mission here was in order that the disciples would have the opportunity to go out and participate in mission work that they'd be participating in later while Jesus Jesus was still with them so that they could come back to Jesus. And we see that at the very end of this story in verse 30 that after their mission work, they come back to Jesus and have kind of a time of debriefing, if you will. And so I think that was probably the main reason. Jesus wanted the disciples to go ahead and, and try their hand and, and get their feet wet in ministry while He was still there watching over them and, and able to interact with them. Um, second, what authorization, uh, I'm sorry, before that, what preparation did the disciples have for this? Well, in, John, in uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, we see that when Jesus called the disciples, that it says that He called them that they might be with Him, that they might preach, and that they might cast out demons. And so up until this point, the preparation that the disciples had had is that very first thing. They had been with Christ. They had been witnesses both to His miracles, they had been witnesses to His public teaching, and as we saw in chapter 4, they, were, uh, they benefited not only from the public teaching of Christ, but also from private instruction. In chapter 4 it told us that He preached in parables to the masses, but privately He explained things to His disciples. He also gave them a special authorization. 
Uh, Jesus sent them out in his name. In Judaism at this time, there was a, uh, ju- there's a juridical background to this, and there was a thing where someone could legally send someone else out as their representative. This is kind of similar to a power of attorney today. Today you can, you can have someone who's a power of attorney and you can authorize them to legally act as your representative on your behalf. And that's precisely what was going on here. Jesus sent these men out uh, to act on his behalf. And the things that they did, they, they were not doing on their own, in their own power or with their own authorization, but they'd been authorized by Jesus to do all of the very things that they did. And so it's not surprising then that we see them doing all of the same things that Jesus did. They were teaching, they were casting out demons, and they were healing the sick. Jesus gave them some uh, special instructions here and a couple of words about these special instructions. First of all, this is not the Great Commission. These are not necessarily abiding, permanent, valid instructions for us today. And we see even uh, in 2 Corinthians 11 that the Apostle Paul did not abide by these. Jesus tells these men as they go out that uh, they should stay in in homes and they should be beneficiaries of the hospitality of the people among whom they're working. We see in 2 Corinthians 11, for example, that Paul is making tents and he's working himself. And so this is not the Great Commission. These were instructions for this particular mission. And uh, I think there were two reasons for that. One, I think that these particular instructions have to do with the urgency of the mission, but more so I think they have to do with what Jesus wanted the disciples to learn. And most of all, he wanted them to learn dependence upon God. Essentially, all of these instructions were intended to make them weak. They were intended to strip away from them any uh, human help, any help that they might have uh, from themselves such that they would be utterly and totally dependent upon God. And so what were these special instructions? Essentially there were four things. Um, First of all, it wasn't necessarily an instruction, but it was something that Jesus did. He sent them out in groups of two. Why did he do that? He did that in order that they could meet the standard of a truthful testimony. In Deuteronomy 17.6 and in Numbers 35.30, the law said that in order for a testimony to be truthful, there had to be two witnesses. And so he sends them out in groups of two, and they are testifying about the things that they've seen and heard from Jesus. They're, they're, They're witnesses about the kingdom of God. Second, there in verses 8 and 9, Uh, He gave them all these commands about the things that they were not to take. And these are things that people normally would have taken if they were going to go out on a trip. And again, what was the point? The point was to strip away any self-sufficiency, to strip away any help that they might have from themselves such that they would be totally dependent upon God. Um, Then in verse 10, he gave them the command of whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And what he meant was, when you come to a particular village, if you enter a house as guest to be be housed there while you're in that village, don't go to another house in the village. In other words, the idea was that it's possible that they could have gotten there, maybe a really poor person would have invited them to stay and they would have accepted. Then a couple hours later they find out, hey, you know, the richest guy in town over here would would have offered to allow you to stay with him. And Jesus didn't want them jumping around, going from house to house. He didn't want them uh, seeking easier, more comfortable accommodations because that would have uh, looked bad for them and it would have looked bad consequently for Christ, whom they were representing. The fourth thing, Jesus gave them an instruction about how they were to respond to rejection. He says, if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Now, Jews in Jesus' day, whenever they traveled outside of the promised land, whenever they would come back to Israel, they had the custom of shaking all the dirt out of their clothes. And the idea was they didn't want any remnants of those pagan lands contaminating them or contaminating the promised land. And so this is a very powerful thing that Jesus is telling these people to do. What he's saying essentially is even though you're going out and you're going to share this message with Jews in the promised land, if these Jews in the promised land reject the message about me, they're showing themselves to be pagan. 
You shake the dust out of your clothes when you leave their village because essentially, even though they're Jews living in the promised land, they're sh by rejecting me, they've rejected the true Messiah, they've rejected salvation, and they've shown themselves to be pagan and to be lost. And so Christ gave them that instruction for facing rejection. And we see in Acts 13, 51 that the Apostle Paul actually did that <clears throat> on one occasion. Well, finally, with regard to this little story here, what was the fruit of this mission? At the very end uh, of the passage, which we actually didn't read today, in verse 30, we see that the apostles reported back to Jesus and told, that, told Him all that they had done and taught. Uh, it doesn't tell us much beyond that, but in light of, of Luke chapter 10, verse 17, where Jesus sent 72 people out on a similar mission, and then they, they came back to Christ and they reported to Him with joy, I think it's safe to, 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 to expect that uh, some people would have responded favorably to the message of the disciples. But I think it's also safe to expect that the response to the disciples was probably similar to the response that Jesus Himself had been encountering. In other words, some people responded positively to the proclamation of the kingdom of God and some people responded by rejecting it. And so I think it's safe to assume that the responses to the message of the disciples were, were similar to those of Jesus's, and therefore their proclamation of the gospel would have had a sifting effect. It would have had the effect of separating wheat from tares, believers from unbelievers. I think there was one other um, fruit of the mission, and, most, and this may have been very well the most important thing, and that's what God would have been doing in the disciples. That's what Christ would have been doing in the disciples themselves. And I think that there were at least three things that they probably learned. First of all, in light of verses 8 and 9, I think that they would have learned to trust and to depend on God to provide for their every need. And I think we can assume that He did as they were out there and they didn't take anything with them. In other words, Jesus just sent them out there with nothing that you would normally take on a trip. And, and I think the thing that he wanted them to learn was that they could depend on God to provide for every need. Um, second, up to this point, the disciples have been seeing Jesus do great things. And perhaps even though they're confused and even though sometimes they're lacking faith, their faith in Him maybe had been growing. But on this uh, mission, I think that they would have been able to see that, that God was also able to work through them. In other words, their faith would have grown not only in what Jesus could do, but in what He could do through them. And then finally, and, and most of all, I think that they would have learned to identify with Christ in suffering and rejection. Up until this point, they've just been witnesses. They've just been kind of following along and hanging out with Jesus. And it's true that the religious leaders kind of approached them at one point, and they're like, why are you doing this? Why is your master doing this? Etc. But up until this point, we don't really see that anyone has just sharply rejected them. They've just kind of been witnesses to what's happening to Jesus. Well, now it was their turn. Now Jesus sent them out. He gave them instructions for what to do when you're rejected. In other, in other words, he knew that they were going to be rejected. And so they personally got to taste this rejection of Christ in themselves. And they got to experience it for themselves. And in that way, they got to identify with Christ and His suffering and rejection. Well, a couple of brief points of application here. Uh, although the, the, this is not the Great Commission, although these are not necessarily... Uh, abiding uh, principles for how we're supposed to do missions today. I think that the principle of staying in the same house and not moving around uh, still has something to say to us. At the very least, what we see there is that for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the proclamation of the kingdom, they were to be willing to be uncomfortable, to accept maybe less than desirable accommodations. And certainly um, in our case, there, there, today, there are many dark places in the world where there's just no way to go there comfortably. And for someone to go there, to take the gospel there, it's going to have to be uncomfortable. And yet that's something that if the Lord calls you to that, you should be willing to endure for the sake of the kingdom. And then another application that I'm going to just mention briefly because I'm going to talk more about it here as we consider the death of John the Baptist, uh, is that the Lord, if you're following Christ, has probably already allowed you to experience your turn at rejection and suffering, and He's going to continue to do that because that's part of what it means to follow Christ is, is to, uh, to be rejected as He was rejected and to suffer um, the scorn of people and rejection.
And we're going to see more of that now in the death of John the Baptist. Um, in, these, in these verses, we have a very ominous story uh, of the death of John the Baptist. It's interesting, this is the only story in the Gospel of Mark that does not center on Jesus. Uh, you don't see anything really of Jesus here in the story of John the Baptist. It's also interesting that Mark, at the beginning of the Gospel, only dedicated three verses to talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, and now he dedicates 14 verses to talking about the death of John the Baptist. So that would lead us to ask the question, well, what precipitated such a long story about the death of John the Baptist? And what we see is that um, in verse 14 it says, King Herod heard of it. Well, what did he hear of it? In light of the previous verses, it seems like he probably heard of the mission activity of the twelve that Jesus had sent out. They had been uh, doing their mission activity in the area where he was a governor and a, and a ruler, and he heard of it. And then he began through that to hear about Jesus, and then this led to a discussion of the identity of Jesus. And there were several suggestions that people were making. Some people were saying that he was Elijah, some people were saying that he was one of the prophets from the Old Testament. And some people were saying that he was John the Baptist who'd come back from the dead. And so what precipitated this whole discussion of the death of John the Baptist is the fact that some people were saying that Jesus was John the Baptist who had come back from the dead. And it tells us that Herod himself believed that Jesus was John the Baptist who had come back. So this tells us a, a few things about Herod. First of all, it tells us that at least up until this point, Herod was unaware of Jesus. If he'd been aware of Jesus, he would have known that Jesus was a contemporary of John the Baptist, that they'd been living during the same time. But the fact that he thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist refer, uh, returned from the dead indicates that he thought Jesus had just come on the scene out of nowhere. Uh, secondly, the fact that he thinks that Jesus is someone who has been reincarnated uh, shows that he was kind of a superstitious person. Uh, and finally, the fact that he's thinking about this shows that he has a guilty conscience about what he did to John. He's not been able to forget uh, what he did. Well, who was this Herod? Uh, actually, there are several Herods mentioned in the Bible. For example, in Matthew 2 and Luke 1, it mentions Herod the Great, and that is not who this Herod was. This is actually Herod Antipas. He was the son of Herod the Great, and he was not king, quote unquote, king of all of Israel. Rather, he was the tetrarch of uh, Judea and Perea, which were just, was just essentially, basically he was the governor of part of Israel in the Roman system. He was a governor of, of part of the territory, even though he calls himself a king here and he makes a promise about giving away half of his kingdom. That's actually kind of presumptuous and, and he's kind of elevating himself in his own eyes because re essentially he was a governor of, a, of just a part uh, of Israel. Well, why had Herod jail, jailed John? Uh, according to uh, verses 17 and 18, he had jailed him because John had publicly been denouncing his relationship with Herodias. And so we saw at the very beginning of the book that John was proclaiming a message of repentance and of turning to God. And what we see here is that his message was not limited simply to the masses, but he actually directed it at the ruler. He was bold enough to direct it at the local governor. And uh, John was uh, denouncing his relationship with Herodias as unlawful. And there are actually three problems with, John, uh, with uh, Herod's marriage to Herodias. Uh, first of all, according to Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, he says that both Herod and Herodias divorced their spouses in order to be able to marry one another. Um, secondly, Herod was Herodias's uncle. So this is actually an incestuous relationship. But the biggest problem is that um, Herodias had been married to Herod's brother, and she divorced Herod's brother in order to marry him. And according to Leviticus 18.16 and Leviticus 20.21, 20, that was clearly against the law. You're not supposed to marry your brother's spouse uh, while your brother was living. And so that was the biggest problem, and that seems to be the main reason that John was denouncing what Herod and Herodias had done. Now, not only was this offensive and personally annoying to Herod, it was also potentially politically explosive because, uh, also according to Josephus, uh, Herod's first wife had been the daughter of a neighboring king, 
And so as if there weren't already some hard feelings, having John continually bringing this up in public would have just been stirring the pot and creating this political tension and this politically dangerous situation for Herod. And in fact, also according to Josephus later, uh, Herod was invaded by that neighboring kingdom and had to be rescued by the Romans. And so it was uh, very politically explosive in addition to just being uh, annoying to Herod. Well, what, what were the attitudes toward John uh, among the people here? It tells us clearly that Herodias hated John and she wanted to have him put to death. And yet it also tells us that, Her and she held a grudge against him, but it tells us that Herod feared him and that Herod liked to listen to him preach and he was perplexed and, uh, and at the same time he didn't ever accept what he had to say. Now in a parallel passage in Matthew 14, 5, it says that Herod also hated John. And so I think we can understand that Herod feared John, but in, in Matthew 14, 5 it says he also feared the people, but Herod also hated John. And so it seems like he was perplexed, he liked to listen to him preach, he hated him, but most of all, he didn't put him to death because he feared the people, because the people considered that John was a prophet. Well, Herod had a, had a plethora of sins here. Um, first of all, he sinned through his adulterous relationship. That's what led to all of this. But then he sinned by violating his conscience. Verse 20 says, uh, Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And so Herod had imprisoned someone whom he knew to be righteous and holy. So he also sinned by violating his conscience. Then in his birthday party, I think there's at least six sins, six more sins that he committed. Um, it, it doesn't say directly, but I think it's implicit that this was a drunken party. This was just a big, you know, worldly pagan birthday bash. I think it's also implicit, and most of the commentators agree that when Herod's stepdaughter came in to dance for them, that it was a lewd, sensual dance that, that also would have been sinful in nature. Um, then, to make things worse, Herod makes a foolish promise. He just blurts out you know, this oath that he's going to do whatever she wants him to do. And then, when the girl requests something sinful, when she asks him to commit a crime, instead of repenting of it and saying, you know what, I made this oath, but you're asking me to do something sinful and to commit a crime, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. Instead of doing that, he caves in and does it. And why? Because of fear of man? Because of concern for his own reputation? He wanted to follow through with this promise? He was afraid uh, of what people would have thought of him? And so then finally he does commit this crime. Well now, here we come to the very sobering part. What can we learn from John the Baptist's death? And I think there's a few things we can learn. And before we get to that, I want to remind you of who, who John the Baptist is, especially maybe for those of you that weren't here when we looked at this at the beginning of Mark. John the Baptist was the herald of Christ. One of the themes running through the, the book of Mark is that of the kingdom of God and that Christ is a king who's come to proclaim and to establish His kingdom. And just like other royalty in ancient times, Christ also had a herald. He had someone who preceded Him and proclaimed His coming. That person was John. John was also a prophet. He was the first prophet to have come on the scene in over 400 years. And His coming was so important that we saw at the beginning of the book of Mark, even the, not only the coming of Jesus, but the coming of John the Baptist was prophesied in the Old Testament. And Mark even begins his gospel by saying that the gospel, the, the events of the gospel begin with John. That the coming on the scene of John was the putting in motion of the events that led to the gospel. And here's what Jesus himself said about John in Matthew 11, verses 9 through 11. He said, What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will be prepare before your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus affirmed that John was a prophet, that he was more than a prophet, that his coming was the fulfillment of prophecy, and that no one greater than him, that there had never been a greater man than him. And so there's a few things here I think that we can learn from John the Baptist's death. Obviously, first of all, I think we're supposed to see in it a foreshadowing of Christ's death. The fact that Mark takes so much space here to give us this passion story of the herald of Christ is clearly pointing forward to the death of Christ. If the herald of the king is put to death, 
what might we expect for the king himself? In other words, it's a foreshadowing of, of Christ's death that is coming. Second, I think we could learn from John's courage. He was called to preach truth. He was called to call people to repentance. And he was courageous in doing that, regardless of the consequences. And the consequences were very bad for him, and yet he did it. But here's what I think, most of all, we should learn. And it's what I said at the beginning. I think that we should come to a sober understanding of what we are and are not promised as followers of Christ. And particularly, we should understand that in following Christ, we're not promised comfort or ease or especially safety. This is not safe. What happened here to John shows that he did not uh, enjoy safety. Think about this. Think about John. He's this great servant of God. He's this important player in the plan of salvation. His coming is prophesied in the Old Testament. There's been no one born of woman greater than him. He's the prophet that gets to announce the Messiah is actually here. He's the herald. He's the forerunner. And how did it end for this great man of God, for this servant of God? Did God keep him safe? How did it end for him? He's wickedly and wrongly arrested for preaching the truth. And then he's, uh, the wicked man who arrests him has a drunken birthday party, enjoys a lewd, sinful, wicked, sensual dance by his stepdaughter, blurts out a rash promise and then concedes to, to, to kill John in a wicked and an embarrassing way, having his head brought in on a platter. And just think about that. That's how it ended for this great servant of God. Um, if that happened to John, if Jesus was later also put to death, I think we need to come to grips with the fact that following Jesus does not necessarily... Uh, lead to safety. In fact, Scripture has a whole lot to say about suffering. Let me just reel some things off here for you. In Matthew 24, 9, Jesus told His disciples they would be persecuted and hated. In Mark 13, 13, He told them that they'd be hated by all for His name's sake. In John 15, 17 through 20, He told them that if people had persecuted Him, that they would also persecute the disciples. In John 17, 14, He said the world had already begun to hate His disciples. In Philippians 1.29, Paul said that it's granted to us not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. In 2 Timothy 3.12, we're told that all who want to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In 1 John 3.13, we're warned not to be surprised if the world hates us. So, what's the point of all this? I'm not suggesting that we go out and seek to invite persecution. I'm not saying we need to be obnoxious and have people hate us for something other than the gospel. And I think we need to be careful there. I think some people uh, maybe who live in countries like our own where you don't see a lot of persecution feel like, ah, I should be persecuted and, and want to run out and, and kind of invite it. And they might bring it on themselves for something other than the gospel. So I'm not suggesting that we do that. We don't want to be hated by people for anything other than the gospel. But at the same time, we need to recognize what we've gotten ourselves into in following Christ. And it's something that is not safe. It's something that indeed could lead to danger. It's something that in, indeed could lead to uh, situations that are not safe. The Lord might call you to frontier missions somewhere where you might be martyred. Our brothers and sisters around the world are currently living this reality. And Paul has just returned from some of those places and met with people who have been persecuted. Um, the political situation in our country could turn or, or rather could continue to go the direction it's going such that we might come to the day where our government is prohibiting something that the Bible commands or commanding something that the Bible prohibits. And so I think we need to recognize that Things are not necessarily going to be safe for us in following Christ. And we just need to soberly realize that and accept that. Well, then what are we promised if, if we're not promised safety? Uh, I think that Romans 8, 35 through 39 encapsulates very well the answer to that question. There it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so notice that that text says that in these things were more than conquerors. It says that in tribulation, in distress, in persecution, in famine, in nakedness, in danger, when faced with the sword or death, In other words, it doesn't deny that those things could happen to us. Those things have happened in history to many Christians. Those things are happening today to other Christians. Now at the same time, millions of Christians have lived and died and not experienced those things. And it's possible that those things won't happen to us. But we need to recognize that perhaps like a soldier who is a part of an army that in a foreign land is is engaged in a war, that very realistically, at any moment, we could find ourselves in that situation. That that's a possibility. But most of all, we should rejoice that, that in these things we're more than conquerors. So what's the point? What do we have? What has God promised us and given us? Well, the greatest hope of Christianity that we have is that we irrevocably, if you're in Christ, belong to Christ. That God is going to cause us to persevere in faith even in the midst of these things. If you belong to Christ, even if you find yourself in these things, God is going to be with you. God is going to help you persevere by faith. As we saw a couple weeks ago, Jesus did not prevent the disciples from ending up out in the storm. But He was there with them. And likewise, He's not necessarily going to keep us out of any storms. But if you're in Christ, you can know that He will be there with you. And that He will cause you to persevere. And so the true hope that we have as believers is that if we belong to Christ, He's going to keep us. And we have consequently the hope of eternal life. We do have the hope and the reality of joy now, even in the midst of these things. And so to close, just as I said at the beginning, I I hope that on the one hand, we all can embrace the reality of what it means to follow Christ. It means the possibility of danger. It means the possibility of suffering, uh, of, uh, even of death, even of an embarrassing, painful death. And yet, at the same time, I hope that we can rejoice in what we do have because where else would you rather be? Where, where else would we go, as Peter said? We were crea- as Paul just said, we were created for God, for Christ. This is why we've been redeemed. Where else would we go? There's there's nowhere else that could possibly offer us greater joy and hope than being in Christ. But in the meantime, as we're here in this world, it it can involve suffering. So I hope that we'll embrace the reality of that and at the same time rejoice in what we do have and rejoice in the fact that it's worth it, that, that anything we give up or lose or suffer is worth it compared to knowing Christ and having Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for that reality. Lord, this this story shakes us up. Lord, this story is sobering. This this great servant of Yours died in, in such a wicked and an embarrassing way. And Lord, we recognize that we're living in a dangerous world. And at the same time, Lord, we recognize that You're absolutely sovereign that You're working things out for our good and for Your glory. Lord, we recognize that we do have a glorious hope in You and we rejoice in that. And we thank You for that. In Christ's name, Amen. Please visit our website at heartcrymissionary.com There you will find information about the ministry, our purpose, beliefs and methodologies and extensive information about the missionaries we are privileged to serve.